series of sociological theory lectures after coronavirus. Uh, tonight's lecture is on Hannah Arendt's The Origins of Totalitarianism. Um, the book first came out in 1950. The copy that I use with my students is the 1966 third edition. Um, includes some updates um, um, where she writes more extensively about um, about the Soviet, um, you know, sort of gulag system. Um, you know, so it goes beyond just totalitarianism in Nazi Germany um, to look at, at, at other regimes. Um, but it, it, it's a document that that's it, it's easy to read. She's uh, she writes in English, um, and you know the book includes many many dense descriptions of of historical uh, anti-Semitism, uh, descriptions of of imperialism and and, and and the scramble for Africa, as well as the pan uh, movements uh, in Europe. Um, in the late 19th, early 20th century. And then, uh, you know, the book ends with a really extensive discussion of, of the rise of Nazism and the way that Nazism functioned as a totalitarian regime, again, with comparisons to the Soviet uh, system uh, along the way. Okay, so um, maybe before we begin the book itself, let's look at a, at a couple of images. Um, so this is being recorded in February of 2021. Um, Anti-Semitism has just been in the news a lot lately. So uh, in January of this year, the, um, uh, the Capitol building was, uh, uh, there was a, 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 sort of the, uh, there was a riot at the Capitol building, uh, probably insurrectionary in intent. And um, some of the uh, sort of um, um, analysts had, had noted that one of the uh, men who wound up inside of the Capitol building right here, um, is wearing a T-shirt that uh, a Camp Auschwitz a T-shirt with a um, you know Totenkopf a, a death head um, a symbol and um, a kind of um, I don't know if that's a parody or just a, a sort of an unusual translation. Work brings freedom. Um, you know the Auschwitz um, uh, you know uh, camp uh, logo on it. So you know one of the men who again who engaged in the um, the assault on the Capitol on January 6th uh, was, um, you know, essentially wearing a, a T-shirt. Again, I, I guess satirizing or uh, 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 mocking, I guess, um, the Holocaust. Um, this isn't exactly anti-Semitic, uh, but, but there were also uh, uh, Confederate flags that were inside uh, on January 6th. It was in the Capitol building. Uh, this is an image from the... Um, from the um, 2017 Unite the Right rally in Charlottesville, Virginia. Uh, this is a rally that had the famous, um, you know, image of the tiki torch uh, carrying men, um, you know, uh, chanting, Jews will not replace us. Uh, and um, included in the uh, imagery that weekend were uh, not just Confederate flags, which you see right here, um, but also uh, outright Nazi flags. So, uh, so, you know, we've had Nazis marching in America. So this man is not just carrying uh, the Nazi flag, but he's also wearing a, a T-shirt with, uh, with the Confederate symbol on it. So we've had, again, Nazi symbolism um, actually involved in anti-Semitic symbolism uh, openly invoked in, in um, political uh, riots and political uh, uh, protest activity and riot, um, you know, mob activity, I suppose, mass activity. Um, We've also seen uh, a number of, of synagogue uh, uh, bombing shootings, attacks on synagogues. Um, this is, again, this is being recorded in, in uh, actually, it's March 1 today. So um, this week, um, a man who had attempted to, um, who plotted an attack on a synagogue in, in Colorado was just sentenced to like 20 years in prison. Uh, there have been other synagogue shootings um, in, in the last few years. So um, we've seen a, 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 an uptick in anti-Semitic uh, activity. I think they're tracking this uh, in Europe as well. So Arendt's work um, focused as it is specifically on, on anti-Semitism as a key feature of totalitarianism um, is speaking to events of our day. I want to emphasize, though, uh, maybe before we get too deep into the book, that um, that you... that... that 
you know, I, I, I don't, I'm, I don't have the book in front of me right now, but, but John Paul Sort's, um, you know, short essay, um, anti-Semite and Jew, um, makes the same argument that, um, that, you know, Adorno et al. do in the authoritarian personality or that Henry Dix does in Licensed Mass Murder. And that is that anti-Semitism as such is really a character structure or it's a, um, uh, as a personality structure, it, it, it doesn't require um, um, Jewishness in general. There's kind of like a general prejudiced uh, attitude and that, 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 that there's a, a structure of thought. Uh, that goes along with anti-Semitism. So that anti-Semitism really has very little to do with Jewish people and with uh, any positive quality uh, associated with actual, uh, you know, Jewish folks, but instead anti-Semitism is really a kind of projection outward of a personality uh, a trait or a personality structure, um, I guess we would, uh, character structure. Um, and, and so the Jew is really a projection out of the mind of the anti-Semite. And, you know, I've got here, like, again, this notion of a, of a screen that the, that the person that receives the projection is sort of obliterated by the power of the projection that the anti-Semite doesn't see. Um, again, any qualities of the person that they're looking at, they instead project outward, um, you know, disavowed, um, you know, uh, uh, parts of the self and so on. So, um, you know, Henry Dix's licensed mass murder is really good at this. For what it's worth, you know, many of, of Dix, you know, Dix analyzed, um, or at least interviewed um, uh, SS, um, um, you know, men who were um, working inside of the actual death camps um, uh, in the latter days of the Nazi regime. And many of these men weren't like, you know, lifelong uh avid anti-Semites. It was often there in the background and certainly became that. But, but the, the, the hatred went in other directions, you know, Jehovah's Witnesses, uh, gypsies, um, homosexuals, as, as it were, right, gay people, um, were, were targeted as well. So again, we're really looking at a personality structure, an ideological structure, um, um, as much more than we're looking at a kind of specific um, account of, of characteristics of Jewish people or of, of any actual grievance uh, that's generated by, uh, by Jewish people. It's really projection outwards. So just to say that, so the point of that is that, um, that Arendt's analysis and her claims that anti-Semitism is an, is an essential part of Nazism and totalitarianism in the 20th century, it, it, that, that other people, other um, uh, can be the receivers of the projection. Um, in many ways, uh, the migrant, the Hispanic migrant, maybe the, uh, the Muslim, uh, you know, the Islamic um, uh, a migrant uh, or traveler um, have been receivers of the same kind of projective power that was directed at, at, at Jewish people, um, you know, among, you know, um, um, you know, in, in, in Arendt's work. So, so it doesn't have to be Jewish uh, people, it can be others who are, um, again, who become the screen of the projection outward of the anti-Semite. So just to begin with that before we get too uh, deep into, uh, into the work. So the other thing I'd like to do is, um, uh, so, uh, you know, Arendt's, um, what we're going to do today is we're going to look at, at the first um, uh, part of the book. Uh, it's really divided up into three sections. Um, part one is on anti-Semitism, um, and uh, we're going to work on that today. Um, there's really four chapters, ending with an account of the Dreyfus affair. Um, the um, and then we're going to then our next uh, video will be on imperialism, and then the final section of the book is on totalitarianism. And um, and you know the, again, all parts of the book are interrelated with each other. Um, and there, she really is sort of specifying the kind of genetic origins of the, um, of, of the, um, of the Holocaust and of the, um, of the Nazi regime as it, um, devolved in, um, in the 1930s and 40s. So, um, maybe, uh, so, so we're going to begin with an account of, of, of anti-Semitism. Maybe what I've been doing, you know, in the other recordings is I've been using images to sort of get us started. Um, I have my students in my graduate class looking at, um, the Jew in caricature, 
um, the Juden into caricature, right, from um, by Edward Fuchs. Um, so this is a book, I think late, ni late 19, actually, I think it came out about 1920, at least some of the um, images in the book are from 1920, so maybe it was even a little bit later than that. Um, but, you know, Fuchs did a series, he's sort of the original historical materialist. Um, my friend Kevin Amidon and I have written about him. Um, and, you know, he, he published a series of, of analyses of primarily visual uh, cultural material in the late uh, 20th in the late 19th, early 20th century. Um, Walter Benjamin, uh, uh, you know, wrote a famous essay about Edward Fuchs. And um, so this is one of his, of his books. Um, actually, I wanted to grab some of the images out of it. So um, one of the, of the sections that Arendt uh, has in her section on anti-Semitism deals with the, um, the, the distinction between the pariah, the pariah that Jews is a pariah people, and um, the Jewish exceptional person as a parvenu, as a person who's sort of entering into um, elite society or high society, uh, being accepted into, uh, you know, genteel society, I suppose. And, um, and her claim is, is, that, is that this is a, a double consciousness and that those who enter into um, um, sort of, you know, are accepted into high society are always um, potentially downshifted back into the status of the uh, of the the Jew in general she says uh, the pariah and so you know this caricature here is of a um, is of a costume ball and of a um, uh, a, um, a man and a woman of of, of, of Jewish um, um, extraction at least having all the caricatured uh, uh, markers of Jewishness um, you know, or, or sort of again being kind of mocked as kind of declass, um, um, you know, parvenu kind of kind of adventures coming into the um, the the world of high fashion or high society, and again are always on um, in danger of being uh, cast out um, again as pariah. Um, here's an image. One of the things that Arendt will do towards the end of the book is is, uh, again, make comparisons between Nazism and sort of Stalinism. And um, so this is an image of 1907 of an, an anti-Semitic um, journal in, um, in Russia. Um, you know, again, depicting some of the same images, the same stereotypes of, you know, I think here it's anarchist um, uh, a Jewish a person. Um, I wonder if I should go through all these. I think I will. Um, so um, in Arendt's account of the, um, of the Dreyfus affair, she um, draws attention to um, Edouard Drummond, who is sort of the uh, original sort of um, uh, political anti-Semite in, in, um, in France. He runs the, 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 this, this anti-Semitic journal that was very um, important in the, um, in the Dreyfus affair as she writes about. So this is a cover from 18, I can't quite make it out, 1895, I think, maybe 1898. Um, and, and again, it's short, again, stereotyped, um, you know, uh, caricature um, of, of a, again, all the, all the markers of the, of the um, stereotype projection of Jewishness. And then all of the sort of the virtues of honor, courage, um, veneration, uh, patriotism, work, uh, you know, the sort of the, the, the Protestant virtues, uh, you know, in the mind of the Jewish person here, it, it's the opposite. So that you're worshiping money, honor, you're stealing, and so on, um, you know, so encourage your kicking someone in the back and that kind of thing. So it, it, it's, again, this kind of idea that it's in the air, that, that anti-Semitism, modern anti-Semitism, politically charged anti-Semitism um, is everywhere. I'm going to hold back. Uh, the specific image here of um, of the Dreyfus affair. Um, this is an image of 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 the Rothschilds from 1898, uh, Baron Rothschild, and it's an image of the Jewish international banker, right? That this conspiracy or this the conspiratorial notion that there's a secret society of of Jewish bankers and Jewish financiers who are secretly pulling the strings behind, uh, um, you know, state powers everywhere, 
uh, you know, really controlling the globe. Uh, this is a, a cartoon image of that that, um, uh, again, sort of just depicts it so plainly, right, the monstrous quality of, of the international Jewish banker. So, you know, many of the um, current uh, claims about George Soros, uh, you could just substitute George Soros for this today, right? This idea that there, again, is this, is this elite um, uh, high finance uh, Jewish uh, conspiracy secretly pulling uh, the strings and running the world. This is another image, uh, same thing again, of, of a um, of a Jewish, um, you know, monstrosity or monster, again, sort of controlling it and um, the world. Um, again, like, like many of the anti-Semitic images in uh, Fuchs's book um, depict, uh, you know, um, treason, treasonous activity, a nationalism, if not, um, um, uh, again, again, uh, there's this foreign element that they're not patriotic, that kind of thing. And so here you have, you know, the war um, veteran, uh, you know, the disabled veteran, um, you know, with the, uh, you know, Jewish, uh, um, you know, uh, profiteer running away with um, the profits of war, while the, you know, the uh, upstanding, um, you know, warrior is left behind uh, with, uh, with the, Injury of honor. Um, here's another image, very common in uh, Fuchs's uh, work, where he's showing again, uh, again the, the the Jewish financier, the Jewish banker, um, being carried on the backs of of the hardworking farmer, the hardworking labor. You know, one of the things that Arendt uh, verifies it's in um, other work on on authoritarianism and totalitarianism that it's really the lower middle class that becomes uh, one of the most potent carriers at the kind of carrier strata of political anti-Semitism in uh, the 20th century. And so here's this image, again, from 1898 of, um, of, of again, the, 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 the independent farmer, the peasant carrying, um, you know, the um, non-working, um, you know, predatory or parasitic um, uh, Jewish financier. Um, another image, uh, so... Um, uh, Arendt writes about the problem of emancipation of Jewish uh, uh, um, uh, residents uh, throughout Europe in the 19th century. Um, uh, Jewish people were emancipated at different moments in time uh, in different regions of Europe. And that emancipation, uh, the granting of, of citizenship, citizenship status, um, it was always fraught, right? Because at the same time that you were granted sort of equality of status, you were also forced to give up certain privileges and that this then set up all kinds of, of, of like social discrimination that didn't exist until there was legal equality and political equality. So it's always a fraught thing, as she writes about. So this 1848 caricature shows a, uh, a Jewish person saying something like, you know, oh my God, um, um, you know, I've been emancipated, but, but uh, you know, being attacked by... I'm, I'm assuming what this means, these are people who are wearing barrels because they've been, you know, stripped of their, of their clothing, you know, they've been robbed of their clothing, and so, um, uh, you know, sort of attacking, uh, um, you know, the Jewish person for having, you know, taken their money or something, and, and then again, you know, the clergy, the Catholic clergy and so on. Um, attacking as well. I may be off on this if I am. I'm sorry. Uh, but, but again, these very common stereotypes that are throughout uh, Fuchs's uh, book. Here's another Russian image. This is from 1920. So we know that the book had, had to be from at least 1920. This is an image of Trotsky. Uh, so again, a kind of uh, anti-Semitic um, a portrait of, of Trotsky within, um, uh, you know, so this is a Polish um, um, uh, uh, image. Um, here's another image of, uh, this is 1918, of, um, again, right at sort of the end of the war, again, of the German sort of, um, you know, military um, aristocratic elite, again, you know, sort of um, um, laying down the law or uh, um, um, on, on a um, obviously, you know, you know um, again, all the markers of Jewish, um, um, you know, um, anarchism. Something along those lines. Um, this is an uh, anti-Semitic uh, party poster uh, from I think 1920. Again, with this idea that the um, you know the Aryan Germanic person. We're going to get to this in the second section um, on empire. 
or there's a, a discussion of 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 the eugenics in in Germany and race thinking in Germany, um, but that this plays into this this notion that again that 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 um, you know the lascivious uh, a Jewish person is going to be um, you know um, uh, um, you know uh, attacking the upright uh, moral uh, uh, virtuous um, um, you know uh, Aryan uh, a woman. I hate to be interpreting these things even. It sounds awful. But uh, yeah, it, here's just a quick poster from um, um, 1889. So this is about the time, a few years earlier than the Dreyfus affair, but the emergence of, of, of truly anti-Semitic parties, right? The anti-Semitic parties um, in, in um, European parliaments, especially in France, right? Where the Jew is the enemy um, and, um, and so on. So again, she, you know, political... Uh, anti-Semitism leading to actual parties that are anti-Semitic. You know, in, in um, Arendt's work, she's going to make the claim that the anti-Semitic parties view themselves as parties above parties. They're not really a party that's representing a class interest, but that they are trans-class. And that's sort of what this poster is trying to depict here, really, so that um, that the anti-Semitic party unites workers and the military and, you know, uh, um, you, you know middle-class people. It unites all of these different classes of people. Um, behind the platform of 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 the nation, right? Stand, uh, hold, well, upholding the nation um, by defining it against um, um, uh, Jewish people. So here's another. Again, this is from uh, Fuchs's um, uh, Jewish caricature book. So it's another image of. Um, I think it's the again it's this critique of 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 uh, you know the money lender. Um, and, and squeezing gold and goods from um, from customers or from those that they have uh, um, the non-Jewish people that they have, uh, have interaction with, right? So again, the stereotype of the squeezing, grasping, ultra-capitalist nature of of um, of Jewish people. Again, I, 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 the next couple of images are odd. They're they're actually something that that I find really interesting. Uh, I'm teaching. Um, Zizek's uh, Sublime Object of Ideology later in the semester. And, um, you know, one of the chapters in the book, um, Ideology and Experience, Antisemitism in France at the Time of the Dreyfus Affair, uh, Stephen Wilson's book, um, one of the chapters is on sexual antisemitism, uh, the horrible sensuality of, of, um, of Jewish people during, you know, that, that was part of the ideological framing of the Dreyfus Affair in France. And so there's, there's all of this account of, of um, again, that it's very close to the kind of um, paranoid and, and envious, um, um, you know, the argument that Jezik makes about, about American racists and black uh, Americans where you get this projection outward of that, that the joy and pleasures that I'm not getting, the sexual pleasures that I'm not getting, are, are being taken by someone else, right? And and so the hypersexualization of, of of black Americans is part of uh, of what um, Zizek writes about. But he also writes about it in terms of of anti-Semitism. And this chapter in uh, Wilson's book deals with sexual anti-Semitism. And and Fuchs has a number of images that depict. Um, you know, this is Susanna in the bath, right? And so I'm, I'm really glad it's not in any higher quality than this. But again, the kind of, you know, um, you know, voyeuristic, uh, lascivious uh, uh, um, desire, you know, uh, hypersexuality or something or perverse sexuality uh, that was projected onto Jewish people. Something I didn't know about until, um, you know, just, just a few years ago that this was part of the stereotype. This is a children's book. Again, the same thing about about the the you know you have to watch your daughters um, uh, because the you know hypersexual uh, Jewish person will um, uh, will be there. And again, this is out of Fuchs's book. Um, you know, the, again, this notion of again the kind of perverse hypersexuality of um, that was associated with um, with the yeah with the um, with 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 propaganda. Um, in, yeah. Okay, so um, so with that, then, let's get inside of the book, if we can. So, uh, you know, um, Fuchs's book, again, it, it, it's, it's, um, it's I, I guess in, in Google Books, it's the, just, just Google the Jew in modern caricature or something, the Jew in caricature, 
and and this uh, book will come up with and it's just full of these images from across Europe uh, prior to you know the rise of the Nazis um, um, that really show kind of the long history of anti-Semitism you know woodcuts and so on that go back to uh, you know ver the very dawn of, of printing um, okay so all right so the book then um, so this is Skeleton Key then to Arendt's Origin of Totalitarianism. Uh, the first chapter is on um, anti-Semitism as an outraged common sense. We'll do this really fast. So, she, so Arendt, um, again, places what she always calls montered modern anti-Semitism at the core of Nazism, right? Um, and she's, she argues that it sets the whole infernal machine in motion, Okay. And what modern anti-Semitism is not, it's not ultranationalism. That's one of the claims that she makes, and maybe this is distinct from contemporary um, anti-Semitism, is that it tends to be decoupled from nationalism. And one of her arguments is, is that, is that the anti-Semites were actually supranational and were pushing uh, into, um, you know, the nation into imperialism. So it wasn't a kind of consolidation inside of the nation. It was an outward projection and that there were ties supranational ties among, uh, you know, these anti-Semitic um, uh, partisans and, uh, you know, anti-Semitic actors. So like the Dreyfus affair that she writes about, this anti-Semitic explosion of, of, of uh, you know, political agitation in the, the you know, the, the waning years of the 19th century, that, th that this was followed across many different um, uh, countries, right? So, it, so it's not national, it's supranational. The Nazis, for example, are supranational, right? They're not just trying to stay within German borders. But there's a pan-Germanic movement and they're, they're, they're supranational, supranational. Okay, number two, it's not reaction against actual uh, Jewish power. And she makes the argument that anti-Semitism increases as you know Jewish influence in the state, their importance as state financiers and so on, uh, their importance as... as um, as something like like diplomatic mediators between nation states declines, so as the nation state declines and as the political power of of Jewish people, you know the kind of special status that they had as that declines, anti-Semitism increases. And she argues that it's it's actually wealth without power, privilege um, to exploit and oppress. That once that's gone that then wealth is felt to be parasitical. At least that's the argument that's made, she says. So I should, I, my, my directions tell myself to quote page, um, page five here. Um, yeah. Yeah, here. So, um, yeah, so it's the persecution of powerless or power losing groups may not be a very pleasant spectacle, but does not spring from human meanness alone. What makes men obey or tolerate real power, on the other hand, hate people who have wealth without power, um, is the rational instinct that power has a certain function, is some general use. Uh, and she goes on about that, and she says, wealth which does not exploit lacks even the relationship which exists between exploiter and exploited. Aloofness without policy does not imply even the minimum of concern of the oppressor for the oppressed. So her argument is, is that when you lose power, right, that as you lose power, you um, you set off uh, a kind of reactionary uh, movement uh, to take wealth away. Okay, so um, so that's number five. So it's not mere scapegoating. She argues that Arendt argues that Jews alone uh, fit the category for anti-Semitism, and it could not be another group. So so we need to really be careful here. Um, her argument. I'm going to summarize here in this little image. Um, this is from page seven. She argues that that there that one of the big claims that's made, she calls it a kind of simple shorthand that's that's too simple and therefore flawed, is the idea that that um, that there was a search for a scapegoat in uh, Germany and in France and around Europe in the late 19th, early 20th century, and that Jewish people, being relatively powerless, were scapegoated, right? So that they were powerless and therefore scapegoated. They were an arbitrary scapegoat. Uh, in other words, it could have been anyone. So there's kind of a singularity about this. Any, any group could have, could have been the scapegoat. It just happened to be Jewish people. And, then she contra and she's going to argue that, that that is not the case, right? That that isn't what's actually going on here. That, um, that it had to be a Jewish people. Modern anti-Semitism uh, could only have been structured with Jewish people, she argues. On page six, she says, modern 
totalitarianism uses terror not to exterminate or f um, or frighten opponents, but as an instrument of internal uh, domestic power, right? So this is very similar to Foucault, right? You rule the masses who are uh, who then become perfectly obedient with terror, right? So that you have a kind of um, a totalitarianism, uh, unlike what Foucault argues, where you begin into a disciplinary society, totalitarianism is a kind of reassertion of the traditional world of torture into the midst of a fully modern society, right? So totalitarianism then, um, terror is a form of government that requires a specific ideology that is accepted by many, never all, you, right? That's one of the things you're going to make the claim that you, you, you have to have many adherents to the ideology of terror that underlies totalitarianism, but you never need a majority, right? Um, so many have to do it in order to, for terror, for terror and totalitarianism to stabilize. So, so there was a specific set of circumstances and historical contingencies that led to Jews being placed into the position where they were the object of, 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 um, of oppression um, and, and um, you know, and, and, and terror uh, by anti-Semites. So page six to seven, Jews before becoming the main victims of modern terror were the center of Nazi ideology. So she says it's not, it's not arbitrary, right? That it didn't happen arbitrarily. It occurred for a very specific reason. So page seven, Jews are not arbitrary victims or scapegoats, but are structurally, again, disposed and, and uh, pre even prepared um, and fixed uh, by ideology in position. Okay, uh, page seven again, eternal, uh, in, in, a lot of this is my, my uh, paraphrase, so it's not exactly her, our, uh, her, her framing. Uh, page seven, eternal anti-Semitism and the Holocaust. Um, yeah, so it's a continue. So, so this, yeah, so this is another uh, untrue uh, claim. So if, if, if one of the simple um, folk narratives about anti-Semitism and the Holocaust was that it was, that the Jews are an arbitrary scapegoat. The other one that she thinks is too simple is that uh, that there is an eternal anti-Semitism, that Jews are always hated, that there's 2,000 years of, of essentially Jew hating, as she says, and, um, and uh, Jew killing uh, in European history. And she argues that's too reductionistic, again, that it misses the particularity of modern anti-Semitism. She claims it actually absolves Nazis of their very specific crimes. So it isn't that they were arbitrary scapegoats, that Jewish people are arbitrary scapegoats, and it's not that, they're, that, that the Holocaust was a continuation of 2,000 years of, of anti-Jewish uh, um, agitation and killing. Instead, she claims that there was something very particular about Monty, modern anti-Semitism. So sociology truly is the study of particularity and the where we try to understand the structure of particularity that links the individual phenomena to the social universal, right? That's what we do. Her study is truly sociological because she's trying to understand what it was that 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 led to the particular um, um, manifestation of anti-Semitism, modern anti-Semitism in, in, in the midst of Nazism and totalitarianism in the 20th century. Okay, so I should quote on page seven. Um, again, the uniqueness of Judaism, she says, is, um, yeah, the birth and growth of modern anti-Semitism has been accompanied by and interconnected with Jewish assimilation and secularization and the withering away of old religious and spiritual values of Judaism. So again, she's going to argue this isn't the continuation of history, and it's not uh, nationalistic, all, all these other things, right? That there's a very specific set of conditions that that led to, um, uh, you know, modern uh, anti-Semitism and, and, and uh, totalitarianism. Um, yeah. Anti-Semitism, after all, might be an excellent means for keeping the people together, she argues, so that the assumption of eternal anti-Semitism would even apply an eternal guarantee of Jewish existence. So she writes about a kind of dialectic between um, sort of the the um, the way that Jews themselves experienced um, anti-Semitism and uh, the way that uh, anti-Semites experienced it, right? So so there's the uniqueness then of Judaism. It, it is uh, at, that Jewish people are people without a state, uh, sometimes held together by anti-Semitism uh, itself. So 
page nine, uh, there's a decline of European nation states that linked historically with the growth of anti-Semitic movements, right? So she argues that the downfall of nationally organized Europe is, is accompanied by the extermination of the Jews, that these two things go together. So it isn't um, something like anti-Semitic nationalism that leads to, um, you know, the totalitarian, um, uh, you know, killing of Jewish people. Instead, it's the imperialistic and post-imperialistic downfall of, of nation states that, um, that leads to, um, again, the, the, the uh, totalitarian attacks on Jewish people. So the victory of anti-Semitism over all other isms uh, is what happens during this time. So here she argues that, you know, imperialism, mob and mass politics, Jewish um, position and function within the nation state and the rise and fall of European nation states, all of these things uh, feed into the modern anti-Semitism as a particularity, as a structural, uh, um, um, uh, structurally determined um, event, Okay. So this is the things that she's going to analyze in this these chapters. The rise and fall of European nation states, Jewish positions and functions within nation states, the rise of imperialism, and then mob and mass politics. Those are at least some of the things she's going to talk about. Chapter 2, the Jews, the nation state, and the birth of anti-Semitism, at least modern anti-Semitism, right? She argues that nation states um, are uh, composed of citizens who have equal rights before the law, right? This is the post-enlightenment notion of the creation of the nation of, of, uh, of you know, the social contract of egalitarian subjects. You eliminate legal exceptions. We become a nation of laws, or there's a nation of laws. Uh, uh, you know, the Republican notion that, that all are reduced down to, uh, to a single set of legal uh, uh, civil uh, status. Feudalism uh, had many legally recognized uh, statuses uh, and distinctions. Uh, ar ar aristocrats, uh, serfs, free laborers, merchants, guilds, uh, church officials, guest or pariah peoples, right? Gypsies, Jews, and so on. Uh, there were age and sex differences that were actually written into law as well. So legality, rights, privileges um, varied by status, right? It you. It, who you were determined what you legally or morally were allowed to do, correct? It was who you were, where you fit within the social location of feudal society. And so there were many nations within a nation. There were many special positions within um, feudal society. And our argument is going to be as you move into the nation state, all of those nation within nations, all those special statuses are liquidated, leaving behind a kind of uniform pool of civil ju uh, juridical legality, okay? And so Jewish people who were initially, again, in a, a kind of a special category, um, there were disprivileges and there were privileges associated with their special status. So her argument then is going to be as the nation state rises and as Jewish people are absorbed, are sort of um, 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 melted into uh, the sort of juridical pool, um, that there is both a loss of the special privileges as well as a gain from the loss of disprivileges, right? So it's kind of a, it's, it's always a, um, a kind of a double-edged sword. So nation states post-feudal... Uh, yeah, okay. So post-feudalism, uh, you first had absolute monarchies that required state bureaucratic apparatuses, um, like, like, you know, like, um, you know, Frederick's, uh, the second, you know, uh, Frederick the Great's Cameralism, for example, would fit within that. Uh, you required modern state finance, um, you know, uh, Louis XIV, uh, um, a huge need for state finances to run these newly emergent bureaucratic structures. And so unlike feudalism, which really ran upon feudal services and direct uh, provision of services in courtly, you know, um, you know, attendance and so on, uh, absolute monarchies created a bureaucratic uh, um, administration that required finance. So uh, Jewish people then performed the role of being he called, you know, she calls it court Jews, right? So that you're, so that each of the absolute monarchs of Europe depended upon um, 
families of, of Jewish financiers who had ties across uh, Europe and who provided um, uh, financing, uh, state financing, um, you know, as, as one of their central activities. So, that, so the basis of sort of the special position of Jewish people in absolute monarchies, the reason why they were granted or allowed to keep special status was because of the role that they played in the emerging nation state uh, as, as, again, as court Jews, as she calls it, right? Okay, so modern state finance required uh, that. So, so the historical then role of Jewish financiers in Europe is really important. So page 14 to 15, she sort of walks through four phases of this, four phases of, of these um, sort of special positions in, uh, of Jewish people within uh, the European state system as it evolves from absolute monarchy uh, into uh, contemporary uh, sort of, you know, um, uh, totalitarianism. So, uh, you know, court Jews, that's the term for the financiers for the absolute monarchs. Again, she writes about, you know, these network of financiers located across Europe that provided pools of capital that could then be deployed to finance, you know, state uh, expansion, state revenues, and so on. Okay. Um, two, the post-French Revolution nation state, 1789 to 1870, huge need for money. Um, actually, um, um, yeah, international Jewish bankers, uh, again, remain as international financiers of these emerging nation states, the Rothschilds in particular talked about, but that there's there's a um, increasingly a kind of competition, as she writes about the 19th century, uh, grows and as the need for capital expands and as sort of non-Jewish banks grow in size and power, um, you know, there, there's competition here. So by the time you get to the age of imperialism, which is, what, 1884 on, um, you know, capitalist competition, uh, you know, the spirit of capitalist competition is projected into national, um, um, the nation state itself. Nations become competitors uh, against each other for expansion. This is all in the, in the section on imperialism. Imperialism is essentially the world in which nation states compete against each other in a war of all against all for expansion into you know Africa primarily, Asia, and then again across you know, in, you know, Europe itself with pan movements. Um, so yeah, they compete for expansion and colonial domination, and that individual elite banking uh, uh, Jewish uh, you know firms and families. Um, remain, but um, they become increasingly severed from the everyday Jewish community, right? Uh, the Jew in general, as she calls it, and, and that these few elites who remain uh, essentially b become assimilated into elite class and even elite caste aristocratic society, the remnants of it uh, in the 19th century. Okay, uh, phase four then is... Uh, is the period when Western nation states declined after World War I, um, and she argues that Jewish influence within those states declines as well, leaving behind atomized, um, uh, yet, yeah, yeah, atomized into a herd of wealthy individuals. Uh, uh, odd phrasing there. Um, so the Jews that remain then are non-national. They're viewed as non-national anyway. They're viewed as inter-European, um, a kind of inter-European element. Uh, and therefore, they develop a kind of universal hatred against uh, them, um, contempt uh, because no power. Again, I, I, I'm, I'm really cutting across her her work there and not doing a very good job of summarizing it. Um, but she then discusses those four periods, like on page 18 on, and again, the way that the special privileged status was crucial for Jewish people and for their position in the nation state, you know, both prior to the nation state, during the nation state, and then as it ends, okay? So page 18, um, imperialism then is the merger of state business with industrial capital, okay? So, um, so non-Jewish capital, industrial capital, merges with state uh, business, and, and so you get this kind of this state capitalism, um, so, uh, yeah, and so Jews had risen from obscurity to become part of state finance, but at this moment in time, as, it, it, as the states devolve into imperialism, uh, there's contempt and insignificance. So page 19, um, the international and non-national um, 
uh, nature of Jewish financial networks is easily transformed into uh, go-betweens and mediators and diplomats. So even when a Jewish, um, uh, these, these elite Jewish families weren't playing a critical role as financiers, they were still playing an important political role as go-betweens, mediators, and diplomats, right? They were the inter, they were the supranational inter-European um, a sort of body or group that can connect together these different nation states. Uh, page 20, uh, yeah, she writes about how Jewish people and, and aristocratic groups are similar and that they both have special privileges, they're both familial, uh, emphasize blood ties, all kinds of stuff comes out of that uh, later. Page 22, there's a contradiction between equality and privilege. Again, so as you as the nation state emerges and as Jews are granted equality, they also lose privilege, right? Some of that privilege is the loss of disprivilege, so that's a gain, but other is the loss of these privileged positions. And that as that occurs, as you get legal equality, she argues, you get the growing tension and you wind up getting the emergence of what she calls social discrimination of a really, really virulent variety because there are no longer legal barriers separating out uh, Jewish from non-Jewish people. So, uh, yeah, so, so Jewish uh, privileges are threatened by the decline of the nation state um, as it goes. So page 25, growing tension between state and society. She argues that as um, the 19th century unfolds, reactionary elements, military often uh, uh, anti-Semitic, um, are actually anti-state. The totalitarian movements are supranational, she argues, so they're often anti-state movements. And so anti-state and anti-Semitic um, uh, notions get mapped onto each other. So, so uh, yeah, so in the very late 19th century, to be anti-Semitic was often to be anti-state because Jews were associated with state finance and state, uh, um, you know, roles and diplomacy and so on. And, and on the other hand, to be anti-Semitic was to be anti-state, to be anti-state was to be anti-Semitic. So page 26 to 27, the House of Rothschild is described. We saw that image from uh, Fuchs's book earlier. Um, there's a real um, uh, referent. Uh, yeah, so the House of Rothschild, she argues, was a kind of referent in the real of international Jewish finance, right? That, that, this, that this paranoid notion that still exists to, to this day about George Soros, right? Uh, had a kind of a basis in the real. It's not that it was real, but that there was a kind of real basis for it in the power of the Rothschilds and, 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 and the way that they sort of um, made it possible for international uh, finance to operate. Yeah, so, uh, so Jewish people remained racially distinct. Um, family and blood ties were really important uh, throughout uh, this era. So this is important, she argues, that the idea that uh, Jewish people are a race apart was something that uh, the Jewish people themselves would have affirmed. Page 28. So again, this is what she keeps getting to, that, that, that unlike those who argue that Jews are completely innocent and arbitrary scapegoats and those who argue that the Holocaust was simply an extension of 2,000 years of anti-Jewish activity, she claims, no, that there's a specific structure here, a kind of a specific um, you know, historical trajectory that included things like, again, like, like uh, you know, um, Jewish people embracing the idea of, of something like racial distinctiveness, more on that as we go forward. So on page 28, the 19th century, um, anti-Semitism, regardless of social location, right, there's all these different groups who are anti-Semitic, but they shared a, a whole bunch of, of, of sort of, um, their anti-Semitic ideology shared a number of sort of uh, motifs that, um, they were almost always present. They were inter the Jews were always international. They were secretive. They were highly organized. Um, they were kind of diabolical power behind the overt throne, right? They were aloof. They were disloyal. They were, you know, unpatriotic, or, you know, a-national, treasonous, that kind of thing, indifferent to, to the fate of nations and so on, uh, grasping and all of that. We saw those other things that were in uh, Fuchs about, you know, the sexual nature and other things as well. All right, so early anti-Semitism, this is the next section. Uh, Anti-Jewish feeling um, tended to grow out of economic uh, um, um, interests. And her argument is that modern anti-Semitism is always more than simply like economic uh, resentment or economic competition. There's always a political access to it, right? That it's a political movement. 
So anti-Jewish sentiment in medieval society was often economic and was tied to the kind of the middle class status of Jews that in a world that was predominantly divided between aristocratic overlords, basically, and peasants, right? You had the lord of the manor and the peasants who worked the manor's land. There wasn't much of a middle class except Jewish people uh, did that. In, in Ladislaus Raymond's The Peasants, a book that I wrote about with uh, a former graduate student, uh, Tony Feldman, uh, that, that in, in, in Raymond's The Peasant, um, the Jew in the peasant village plays a very important role as moneylander, as, um, and then because uh, the Jewish Sabbath is on Saturday, the tavern that the Jewish uh, uh, you know, tavern owner operates can be open on Sundays. So on the one day a week that peasants have off, uh, the tavern is open because it's owned and run by a Jewish person, and then because they're, um, this person's able to do things like financing, you know, uh, petty financing, really uh, pawnbrokering more than anything, um, you know, that they, they play this very important function. So you had to have this person in the village, and they, they play an absolutely crucial role, but nevertheless are a kind of object of resentment and it's scorn. Um, there's, there's even the, the sexual element in, in Raymond's book is even there, right, where, where um, you know, uh, worries about, you know, daughters being, um, you know, made pregnant and, and so on come up uh, in the story. So, so Jewish people played a kind of middle-class economic status, and therefore anti-Jewish sentiment was often present in uh, European um, society. Page 30 and on through 32, she writes about aristocratic anti-Semitism in the 19th century. She said there's this odd thing where, where aristocrats and Jewish people shared a number of folkways and shared even a kind of a position, especially the elite or exception Jews. Um, who were financiers and fairly well-to-do and fairly well-connected, they tended to be supranational. Uh, they, again, they weren't tied to the nation. They weren't citizens as such, right? Um, they, blood and family mattered, uh, bloodlines and, and so on. Um, and, then, uh, and they were both anti-bourgeois, that there was a kind of desire to distance oneself from the bourgeois world uh, and, and, and also to view oneself as being better than or above the bourgeois world, right? So they were barred from the bourgeois world, weren't allowed to be part of it, but were also uh, considered above it. So again, this kind of the strange uh, anti-Semitism of aristocrats who kind of saw in Jewish people a kind of odd um, um, competitor almost. There's more to it than that, but there you are. Page 34 to 35, when emancipated and en masse, privileged uh, Jewishness, um, uh, disintegrated or, or, or went away, and uh, yeah, and then and then this is uh, she writes about Marx's critique of of the Jewish problem. So page thirty five, uh, the first anti-Semitic political parties emerge. Um, you know, I showed you one of the flyers from it. Um, they tended to focus again on the lower middle classes, not the working class, not um, um, not the right, right, not the not the successful middle class, right? It was a lower middle class. That is the carrier strata, um, and in part, there the lower middle class is upset because there's ongoing proletarian proletarian proletarianization, where um, you know there's consolidation going on all throughout the 19th century, and small business owners, craftspeople, guild members, um, you know, small farmers, and so on, are are under increasing economic pressure as the, the world is sort of being dominated by large capital. And that proletarianization generates resentment, and then there's um, a, a kind of uh, desire for a search for a, um, for a, um, for a scapegoat, uh, bluntly. And, um, and then there's also a kind of resentment about speculative losses, financial scandals, swindles, that these kind of things tend to trigger a lower middle class resentment that gets directed at Jewish people because they're associated with banking and um, and and difference and so on and so little, lower middle class than resentment of Jews often leads to explosive uh, political um, anti-Semitism. Okay, page thirty-eight. Anti-Semitic parties are not. Uh, this is a big point of hers. So let's just spend a moment on that. Anti-Semitic parties aren't parties in the same way as social democratic parties, a party of labor, or a liberal. Um, um, you know. Um, 
what would it be? That uh, you know, something like the Republican Party in America was at one point a kind of pro-business party. So, so where it's associated with, with, with a social class or something, right? Or there's a peasants party or something like that. The anti-Semitic party seeks to be a party above parties. It's an identity party. It's not an economic class. It's an identity party, right? So it's an identity party that represents the entire nation. And this is really important to her. Uh, so this is page 38. Um, I haven't read a quote in a while, so we'll take a look at this. Um, yeah. So the anti-Semitic parties aim to be, yeah, parties above all parties. Uh, they announce clearly their aspiration to become and represent the whole nation, uh, to get exclusive power, to take possession of the state machinery, to substitute themselves for the state. And so this goes on, and I just want to point to this, this is exactly what, um, what the Nazis attempt to do. Uh, Franz Neumann's great book, Behemoth, outlined how uh, the Nazi party substituted for the state. It became the state, right? It took over the state. It was a takeover. It was a movement, a revolution that was directed at the state instead of directed at um, one class within the state, okay? All right, so it's, a, so it's above uh, parties in, this, in the economic sense. It becomes an identity movement instead. So 30 to 39, like Nazi party later, the 19th century anti-Semitic parties, uh, focus upon the nation against the state, right? The nation against the state, the nation against the state, the nation against the state. The state is a foreign thing um, run by Jews or run by uh, some alien element. Some, um, you know, in our time, I guess it's run by, um, what, by coastal elites or run by international financiers or run by the um, big tech, you know, billionaires or something, right? There's all kinds of framing on the cultural right today uh, that uses the same framing. But the nation, the real people, right? The real people, um, um, right? Against the state. The state is an alien enterprise. So, so they're trying to replace the state political organization with a party apparatus. That's the goal, okay? So page 39, this is ultimately linked to imperialism, right? That means that imperialist parties elsewhere that emphasize growth and expansion rather than staying within national borders but seeking colonies and expanding outward, right? That these parties also viewed themselves as parties above parties, but they were almost all eventually absorbed into anti-Semitic parties. This is important. So supranational organization of anti-Semitism uh, is important. It was always supranational. It's not, it, again, it's a party of parties. It's going to represent the nation to uh, other nations, that kind of thing. Unite Europe against um, impurity, that kind of thing. Again, that's not her actual phrase there, but that comes up later. Page 40. Jewish groups are already a nation uh, um, among nations or a nation above nations or a nation um, within nations, right? It's not the nation. It's something else. Jewish, uh, Jewish society was. So it, um, yeah, so, and, and, and that was being met then with this new supranational uh, uh, anti-Semitism. So page 41, the great difference from 2020, she articulates, anti-Semitism was international, right? Or at least supranational, as was socialism. And so today, I think right-wing politics in particular are isolationist, nationalistic, right? Make America great again, right? It isn't make... Um, you know, supranational uh, uh, people great again. It tends to focus on, on the nation, right? So whatever anti-Semitism is here, whatever totalitarianism is, at least on the surface, if it is totalitarianism in America, it's not international. It tends to be very nationalistic, maybe more so um, than Nazism was even. Again, what she argues is that Nazism had an ideology of nation, but it functioned supranationally. Okay, page 42. Leftist anti-Semitism was larger critique of finance capital banks uh, linked to, uh, you know, swindles and scandals, that kind of thing. And this continues to this day that there is a, a, a large contingent of leftists who, um, who identify, you know, finance capital, speculative finance and so on as the real problem um, in capitalism. My own first book, Speculative management takes that line in some ways, and I was rightly critiqued uh, for for not being more careful uh, to articulate how um, the critique of finance capital and the critique of speculation and swindles and bubbles and so on um, is just a part of a larger critique of capital 
and that historically uh, the critique of finance capital has been linked to um, uh, to to anti-Semitism. So uh, again, my 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 first book doesn't deal with this um, as well as it should have. So and because it, it's a critique of finance capital, so leftist anti-Semitism takes that form, right? That 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 the international Jewish banker. Uh, um, the, the word Jewish is added on. So instead of a critique of banks or international finance, you add the word Jewish to it. And again, if you, m- much of the work I cited and worked with uh, in my, my first book was um, really just had the word Jewish removed from it, and I should have been more aware of that when I wrote. Page 45, Pan-Germanists. Um, yeah, nationhood, something above, yeah. So nationhood is something above nation-state. This is important just as imperialist uh, ideology of expansion. So what's really important here, again, that to, to the degree to which uh, Nazis were nationalist, um, they're, they're also pan-Germanist, so that na- the nation doesn't stop at the border, the physical border of the territory. It expands outward. So pan all German people, people united by blood, people united by language, and so on. Uh, are, are, are part of the nation. So the nation is an idea. It's something united by blood and so on. It's not uh, uh, territory. So page 46, um, French, anti- French anti-Semitism uh, is to, uh, talked about. It was, it was uniquely anti-statist. Uh, it was really, uh, some, uh, it was directed against state worship and uh, uh, Jewish people were, uh, were attacked as a mechanism to attack the government because Jewish people, again, were associated with state finance and with diplomacy and other uh, state functions. So to attack Jews was to attack the state. And in the Dreyfus affair, because it was sort of liberal elements within and Republican elements who were most vigorously defending Dreyfus, the, the, the Jewish man falsely accused of espionage, apparently, since it was the liberal Republican elements that were defending uh, Dreyfus, the anti-Semites tended to be, um, you know, those who were against liberal uh, Republicanism, right? So again, the attack against the Republican state is, and the nation state is linked to anti-Semitism. Page 47, French anti-Semitism had Catholic clerical support especially Jesuit support. More on that later. So, uh, yeah, the main focus was um, anti-Rockschild on the left, but there was also this large element of, of, anti, of Catholic uh, anti-Semitism uh, fueled by Catholic clerics. Uh, page 48, anti-banker anti-Semitism is augmented by nationalist uh, anti-Semitism. Uh, so there were groups that distinguished bef- between native and migrant Jews or native and foreign Jews, and that um, that, that was what, what she calls uh, you know, nationalist uh, anti-Semitism. But really the big movements when they get going totalitarianism obliterates that anyway. Page 49, she writes about a Celine um, who, um, yeah, who had the, this this sort of an ideologue who argue, argued that Jews um, uh, caused wars. Uh, this was, um, you know, after World War One, and demanded the massacre of all Jews. So this is sort of the emergence of this anti-state, um, uh, international uh, uh, movement to get rid of Jewish people everywhere. So exterminate Jews as the answer for all political problems was something that Celine uh, was sort of the innovator on. So France never developed an imperialist party, and it never really developed imperialist anti-Semitism. And she thinks that's one of the reasons why Celine's um, anti-Semitic screeds didn't uh, sort of catch fire. Okay, So she writes about the golden age of security for Jewish people in Europe around the turn of the 19th to 20th century. The growth of monopoly capitalism and large industry de- it meant that the significance of Jewish bankers declined. And, um, yeah, that they were essentially, uh, um, yeah, that they were therefore forced to branch out into retail businesses, trade, and so on. And, and into what, what, what she writes about is sort of cultural pursuits, right? Artistic pursuits, intellectual pursuits, uh, that there was social ambition uh, that... Uh, that replaced political and even economic ambition, right? 
And so there was this whole group about 1900, or excuse me, yeah, about 1900, of, of Jewish people who were obtaining prominence in all kinds of fields, in, in, in academia, in the arts, in, in sciences, in letters, and so on, right? So she write, wrote about the search of fame to prove oneself to be an exception to the general uh, Jewishness around um, in which one, from which one emerged. Page 53, the prominence of Jews in 1900, uh, Jews became symbols of society itself. She argued that as Jews became more and more preeminent in different fields, they became associated uh, with society itself. So those who were antisocial and, and uh, nihilistic began attacking uh, anti-Semitism. So you really have the emergence of anti-social anti-Semitism. So there's all these different sort of, um, I guess, meandering rivers which are all feeding into modern anti-Semitism as such, all of which is historically contingent, all of which is particularized to this specific moment in history, and it depends upon all kinds of other movements coming together in order to ignite what becomes, uh, you know, essentially the anti-Jewish Holocaust. Chapter 3, then, The Jews in Society. Page 54, uh, political anti-Semitism then. Jews uh, are viewed as a separate uh, and, and even privileged body of people and that that's uh, distinguished from social discrimination in which Jews are uh, viewed as people who are equal and, um, and are kind of uh, mixing in and therefore need to be actively discriminated against. So her argument here is that as you get political equality, you get increased social um, civic discrimination, right? You get sort of, I guess we would call it microaggressions today that, that, that really mattered in a way because of legal equality. It isn't until you get the mixing in of Jews with non-Jewish elites that it becomes really important to begin discrimination. So racialization of Jews and the explanation for Jewish distinctions, yeah, is, is described in your page 56 between pariah and parvenu. So I showed that image earlier. Um, so the Jew in general, poor people, um, peasants, uh, Eastern European people, especially um, Jewish people, remain pariahs. Um, and even if you get uh, emancipation and, and take on the status of citizenry, you're still not socially acceptable. The parvenu is what she calls the exception Jew, the exception right? The person who is being accepted because of their preeminence, because of their excellence, right? Uh, because uh, their exemplary quality. So they're foreign and exotic because they're Jewish, right? Because you're Jewish, you have a kind of foreign glamour about you, exotic glamour that uh, allows you to sort of stand out. But if you're too Jewish, you would get rejected uh, as a pariah. And so, therefore, you have to maintain this kind of strange tension, a kind of double consciousness, a kind of knife edge between being Jewish enough to carry forward the kind of exotic appeal without being too Jewish that you're lumped in um, with the pariah uh, crowd, the Jew in general. And so, the key to this whole thing is to be exceptional, right? To avoid the social distancing of elites against Jewish people, you have to be exceptional in some way, exceptionally talented, and so on. So, you know, the, the um, 18th century philosopher uh, Moses Mendelssohn is probably the most uh, uh, prominent example of that. She writes about that in, in, at some length. Page 60 to 61, so privileged, wealthy Jewish people are accepted, especially after emancipation, while masses of, of, um, of, 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 of basically poor, non-exceptional Jewish people retained uh, pariah status, right? They still remain social pariahs. Okay, um, so so exception Jews then, as she calls them, uh, have to remain excellent and exemplary in order to keep their status as acceptable elites, right? So social discrimination created the category of the Jew itself, uh, 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 distinct without uh, legal backing. So the, the social category of the Jew as an object of projection, as an object of, of, of not legal um, um, disqualification, but more of social uh, degradation emerges here.
Okay, she writes about that. Page 63. So international Jewish bankers then did create the appearance of an elite supranational uh, uh, Judaism, or excuse me, uh, or, or Jewish Jewish group, um, and and bec- and they were a group of people who is moving into elite society everywhere. So assimilation of exception Jews became commonplace, even conversion to Christianity, um, and this threatened the survival of Jewish society. If elites within the Jewish community were converting out of Judaism, or at least were assimilating with inter-Christian, basically Christian society, or non-Jewish society, um, then, it, then it was a challenge to the continuation of Jewish culture, that their distinct culture values and ways were being threatened uh, by this. So again, this constant tension that's going on here. So the parvenu, the exception Jew who moves into um, elite circles, had a double consciousness then. Uh, both being a Jew but not a Jew. I think she calls it being a Jew at home and uh, uh, but a not Jew in public, something like that. So you have to avoid the taint of stigma, the pariah Jew in general, right? And while still maintaining enough Jewishness to get the exotic appeal. So page 66, with conversion out of Judaism into Christianity, Jewishness no longer is tied to religion. It becomes a psychological or even a racial problem. So this is going to be really important. As um, by the 20th century, Judaism as a religion becomes distinct from Jewishness as a racial uh, uh, and even psychological quality. Okay, and that, uh, and then she writes about the parvenu has a double regret. Um, the parvenu. Um, yeah, excuse me, that, that during this time period, after emancipation, there's a kind of double regret that the pariah is um, sad because they don't become a parvenu, and the parvenu regrets assimilating and leaving behind uh, the people, right? That kind of double consciousness that goes on um, among you know contemporary working class people, contemporary black people, um, that kind of that double consciousness. Page 67, Jews... Um, then became either an overprivileged elite with money, culture, and losing their Jewishness in terms of religion and distinctive ways um, as individuals, and they remained an underprivileged mass of people who were over-characterized, over-symbolically coded as, as Jewish, right? So Jewish parvenus were marginal and provisional and always in danger of being downshifted again back into the pariah status. Page 68 to 9, Benjamin Disraeli has, has written about, right, the um, prime, uh, British pri- mid-20th century, excuse me, mid-19th century British prime minister, served twice um, as the ultimate exception Jew within uh, Britain. She writes that Britain didn't have a large population of Jews in general, uh, in part because of premia- previous um, anti-Jewish um, 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 you know, purges that had gone on. And so, um, so the ultimate parvenu. So I'm supposed to read page 75 uh, regarding Jews as a, uh, as a caste, as something like a ruling caste, okay, or being equivalent to a ruling caste. Oh, yeah, so this is, um, yeah, and so there's Jewishness, not Judaism. Do I really want to read this? Yeah, you know, I'm not going to. Yeah, we'll just sort of skip it. Um, yeah, yeah, I've re- yeah, yeah. So, oh, yeah, yeah. So this is Disraeli's writings about uh, um, kind of kind of racializing Jewishness, the chosen people, right? A kind of chosen race. Um, and he had this sort of fantasy, fictional fantasy of, um, of a kind of reconstructed Europe in which members of the chosen people, the race apart, Jewish people, uh, would wind up as kind of um, a ruling caste or at least secret um, um, mysterious powers behind, um, you know, elected uh, or, or hereditary uh, political powers, right? So in other words, there would be either a secret society of Jewish people running the world or an overt uh, society of, um, of a Jewish elite. So quote on page 74, I guess I've already done that. So, so that's where this is at. So Jewishness becomes a race 
in Disraeli's writings uh, itself, right? So Disraeli, again, the, the English prime minister, uh, racialized uh, Jewish people uh, as an elite um, caste akin to the aristocratic uh, 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 caste of, of, of Europe, in which breeding and um, elite status, uh, a kind of secret society, inward-looking secret society status, um, would, would be a marker both of the aristocratic elites and of Jewishness itself. So this is a problematic uh, idea, according to, um, uh, to Arendt, because it winds up, again, just being one transformation away from being anti-Semitism. Page 79, between vice and crime. Yeah, this is that long, uncomfortable discussion of the sort of similarities between Jewishness and and um, gay life, right? What she calls either homosexuality or even worse, inversion or inverts, um, uh, right? So both as vices in fashionable society, exotic, daring, and fashionable. So this is a bizarre section. If you could clean the language up, it's not that far away from, say, Foucault. So the basic argument is that um, in late 19th century, early 20th century elite salons in, um, in your Paris salons, Parisian salons in particular, Viennese salons, um, that uh, Berlin salons, that there would be a kind of desire for you know, uh, exotic avant-garde people and that um, being a little bit dangerous, a little bit on the outside, being possessing a vice um, uh, would give you a strong personality, mark you with a strong personality, and would therefore make you someone sought after in the salons of Europe. So, so this is that stuff about being bored, like there's a generalized boredom going on among elites, and they're looking for new blood or new people to come in with strong personalities and distinctiveness, and hence gay people and, um, and, um, and Jewish people are both marked uh, in such uh, with this. So she says crime is an act, you know, again, this is almost Foucault, requiring punishment, but vice is a psychological, even inherent quality. It's something that's in you that you can't control, basically, a vice. So you compare uh, Foucault and illegalities and delinquency, in which the delinquent becomes uh, the subject of disciplinary power instead of the criminal who's the subject of punishment. She has the same argument here. In her argument, she uses Marcel Proust, you know, the man who wrote or Remembrance of Things Past, who privileged inner experience, right? That everything gets run through inner experience. But the psychological qualities of vice being brought in a broad-minded accepting society, you know, becomes a secretive identity, the core of one's being, uh, being gay, being Jewish, or in Proust's case, being both. Um, so you have this kind of equivocal quality about vices, they're both something that you want to hide, but they're not hideable. They're both something that kind of is discrediting and disqualifying and kind of exciting in the salon culture. So page 83, wherever Jews were secularized, educated, and assimilated, Jewishness was semi-hidden as a vice, right? As a psychological um, and even uh, ultimately a racial marker, a racial identity, a set of proclivities, a psychological structure, and it's, and again, on page 84 and 85, she writes about the parallel between Jewishness and, and gayness or homosexuality, um, that both demonstrate distinctiveness, again, that strongly marked, that strongly um, struck personality, right, that clearly struck personality, um, and superiority to bourgeois society, an avant-garde sort of idea, right? Okay. So I'm supposed to read page 87 uh, at the triple X, no escape from Jewishness as a vice becomes racialized. Well, that's just the point that once once it's not to be a Jew isn't to be a member of the Jewish faith. You could always convert away from that. Instead, it becomes Jewishness that now becomes marked as a kind of inner nature, uh, a, a racial quality, and it can't be eliminated, right? You can't escape it. That leads us into chapter four, then, which is a long chapter that focuses on the Dreyfus Affair. And again, I, I have two books in front of me, uh, uh, Prisoners of Honor on the Dreyfus Affair, written by uh, David Levering Lewis. Um, and, um, and then I think I've already showed you Ideology and Experience by, uh, by Wilson's massive volume. Lots been written on the Dreyfus Affair. Um, 
you know, so basically what happens is, is 1894, a guy by the name of Alfred Dreyfus, a Jewish man uh, from a fairly wealthy family, um, is one of that sort of that first, what, generation of Jewish men that's accepted into elite um, positions in the military. So many of the non-Jewish, you know, Catholic even, um, um, uh, Jesuit officers don't like this. And he winds up getting accused and convicted of espionage and is forced to, you know, uh, you know, to leave the service. But it's found out later that he was probably framed, almost certainly framed, by someone named Esther Hazy. Yeah, so there's Dreyfus um, uh, in 1874. There's Dreyfus about the time that he gets uh, in trouble. Um, yeah, he winds up on Devil's Island. Where's Esther Hazy? I'm trying to look for a picture of Esther Hazy. But I have it here. Um, these people are, it, it, it just it gives you such a sense of what 19th century, late 19th century military society was like all throughout Europe. All the fancy medals, the fancy duds, you know, the showing off. Yeah, there we go. Is this Esther Hazy? Yeah. So there's Major Esther Hazy and uh, Colonel Maximilian von Schwarzkopfen, um, two men who essentially apparently grew mustaches at each other. And, um, and then other men who grew sideburns at each other. But at, at, at any rate, just a, a, an interesting look at Fin de Siegel society. So, um, you know, it becomes a cause celeb, right, that there's this, this massive political mobilization around this case. So, and, and as Arendt says, it's never fully resolved, that it, it, this is a lot like um, the 2020 election right now, where, um, or, or it's a lot like the, the COVID um, virus, right? If you're Democrat, uh, you believe it's real and you take it seriously. If you're a Republican, it's almost a sign of good manners to not wear masks and to get it. And so it's this odd time right now where the belief in the reality status of COVID was linked to political party, where the efficacy of the vaccines are, um, uh, are are differentiated by party. You know, Democrats tend to believe that it'll work. Republicans don't. And then the outcome of the 2020 election, right? Ever since Donald Trump's arg claims, right? Very unsubstantiated claims, lies to be blunt, that uh, that the election was stolen from him and that, and that uh, he actually won in a landslide. It's just, it's simply demonstrably not true and no evidence has been provided that it is, but nevertheless, it isn't resolved. And again, I'm recording this on March 1, 2021. So, so as of this moment, um, Republican leaders in America refuse to acknowledge that, um, that Donald Trump lost the election um, and didn't win in the landslide, right? So, so there's this bizarre moment right now where uh, Dreyfusards, it, it, very much like uh, the 1890s in France, where Dreyfusards, those who backed Dreyfus, and anti-Dreyfusards, those who didn't, remained locked in a position where leftists at that time believed Dreyfus was innocent, innocent, Dreyfus was innocent, and those on the political right thought he was guilty, and that nothing shifted that, right? And years later, nothing shifted it. So, page 92, Dreyfus was a proxy for liberal nation-state Republicans, and then conservatives who were both anti-state became anti-Semitic. And so death to the Jews uh, was, you know, yelled out by mobs in the street, right? And so even like families, you know, so this is like one of the cartoons here. Families were split apart. Uh, people would sit down at tables. And before you know it, you'd have a fight going on because someone would mention the Dreyfus affair. And, uh, you know, uh, you know, I have a feeling many uh, dinner tables um, once you're going to be able to get together after COVID may have that same quality in America if your family happens to contain people on both sides of what is an increasing partisan uh, divide in the United States. You know, the, the Dreyfus affair was huge. You know, here's a, um, a, a reproduced the rules of the game, a form of Dreyfus Parcheesi that was enormously popular in Europe. I have no idea how you would play that thing. But at any rate, um, you know, it was just a, a major, major uh, um, watershed event in European politics and in European anti-Semitism. So, um, yeah, so the, the scandal then surrounding the Panama Canal Company predated this. So this was a, a massive swindle, basically, 
in which members of parliament, um, corrupt members of parliament, uh, had essentially, you know, uh, been been profiting from it. And so you have a kind of a corrupt state. Um, and then the anti-Semitic press got a hold of it. I think I showed you some images from uh, from the uh, yeah, from the anti-Semitic press. And um, in that and outed individual par- parliament members, uh, they did it slowly. They trickled it out over time, building up a kind of of anger. Um, uh, towards members of parliament, and then they revealed that, um, yeah, that that that. that uh, so the, they they got this right wing anti state anti parliament fury going, um, that was also then anti Jewish because as it turned out, uh, the intermediaries uh, linking the members of of parliament to some of the investments um, that went bad were uh, were Jewish. So Jewish people wound up getting. Uh, um, you know, anti-Semitic um, ideology wound up taking over by proxy here. Okay, so you can read more about that. Page 100, then, the army and the clergy against the republic. So the Catholic Church uh, became anti-state and anti-republican, especially. Uh, I'm supposed to read page 101 um, at the triple X. I think this is important because, um, basically, uh, the Catholic Church owed its popularity to the widespread popular skepticism which saw in the republic and in democracy the loss of all order, security, and political will. To many, the hierarchic system of the church, right, the pope, the bishops, the, and all, right on down to the local priests, um, seemed the only escape from chaos. Indeed, it was this rather than any religious revivalism which caused the clergy to be held in respect. So it was an authoritarian impulse that led to a high regard for the Catholic clergy, not devotion to the Catholic God. Indeed, it was, uh, right as a matter of fact, the staunchest supporters of the church at that period were the exponents of the so-called cerebral Catholicism, the Catholics without faith. Okay, so it was basically, you know, Catholics then clamored for more power uh, to all authoritarian institutions. Um, I'll, I'll leave it at that. So, uh, so the Catholic clergy was anti-state, anti-republic, wanted an authoritarian system put in place, um, as did uh, as did the army. So you had a near coup going on here. Um, yeah. So page 103, the entry of the Jews into higher levels of the military then was resisted, um, not just by the by, by, by the Jesuits because they only wanted people in high positions of military power who they had control over in the confessional, believe it or not. Um, so, so that was going on. Yeah, the people versus the mob. Again, page 106 to 107. Yeah, it's a good writing here. Um, um, death to the Jews or France for the French, an almost magic formula was discovered for reconciling the masses to the existing state of government and society. So at any rate, th- 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 this became an important element of propaganda is found to be uh, important. And she thinks that's important because um, in our time, it seems that we imagine that propaganda can achieve all things, that a person could be talked into anything, provided the talking is persuasive enough, that kind of thing. And But she argues that in the end, at this time at least, the voice of the people was considered the voice of God and that a leader would basically follow the mob. So whatever worked with the mob became the things that you would profess, Okay. So, um, so the mob is, so here we have a kind of a critique of the mass or the mob, very similar to Freud in some ways. Um, so the, so she argues that, that, that masses or mobs kind of like the group that was assembled in Washington, DC in January of this year, uh, he, political leaders, right-wing political leaders organized. 